we're carrying on in 2 Timothy. I'm just going to read two verses and then I'll offer a little prayer. Second letter to Timothy. Interesting that uh, Paul speaks a good deal about Timothy in Philippians. I'd, I'd never thought to look that up. <laughs> Second letter to Timothy, of course, as we know, written from prison in Rome. Paul's facing execution under Nero. But he's not discouraged in the least, and he's encouraging Timothy. And we've been looking at some of that encouragement. And uh, I'm just going to read the next two verses this morning. Uh, from chapter 2 and verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Would you pray for me, brother, please, Andy? Pray for us all. Father, once again, we just thank you this morning that we can gather together, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for... Colin, who's going to speak to us, Lord, we pray again you'll help him, Lord, and strengthen him, and strengthen each one of us, Lord. We're weak and needy, and Lord, we need thy word, mm. and we thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Now, of course, this naturally concerns all that precedes all that Paul has already said, these exhortations to be a soldier, to be a labourer, to be a, to be an athlete and so forth. And he's asking him to consider that, of course, for us to consider it too, which, which in some degree we have done, I trust. Uh, but again, it also includes that which follows. Consider what I say, the Lord give you honour all things. Not only what's gone before, but of course what follows. And... Um, <coughs> What we have in this seventh verse is our part, of course, and the Lord's. Our part, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So thank God there is uh, the Lord's part too, without which we'd be in, uh, in some real difficulty. Uh, we must first, of course, <coughs> read and consider. But if we want understanding from the Lord, of course, we must do so prayerfully. Uh, for only the Lord can teach what Paul is setting before us here. Uh, I have something to say on Wednesday about the importance of the Word and the Spirit. I've uh, been quite blessed as I've been thinking about, we're looking at the showbread this coming Wednesday, Lord willing. Quite blessed I've been thinking about the table of showbread and the candlestick. Because the Spirit and the Word, I'm going ahead of myself, the Spirit and the Word always go together, always, always go together. So if we want to understand, we must ask God's help. I'm getting more and more in the habit now, when I pick up my Bible, to, just to read, of asking a blessing from God. Lord, please open my eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Because it is so easy just to take the letter and miss the Lord. So thank God the Lord will give understanding. Uh, things are hidden except he open our eyes uh, the scripture is a book sealed to human intellect uh, for example 1 Corinthians 2 the scriptures are sealed to human intellect 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7 But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor he heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. There it is. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. 
that we receive not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can they know them neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned I think there are at least three helps uh, to getting understanding from the Lord we need to read our Bibles as comprehensively as possible we really would be well to have a reading scheme a reading plan many would suggest to get through the Bible in a year that seems good if you can get through it twice in a year so much the better um, because the best interpretation of scripture is always scripture and so often I've found in, in battling with the passage that another passage will explain it and open it up and so one of the first ways I think to get understanding of the Lord is to read the Holy Scriptures as comprehensively as possible from Genesis right through to Revelation be careful of just reading favourite books because we'll miss so much not that we won't get a blessing you know there are persons in parts of the world of course that might just have a gospel they haven't got the Bible in their own language not that they won't get a blessing but we are greatly privileged uh, to have the whole Bible in our own tongue and not only that probably the best translation that has ever been seen with maybe the exceptions of well they weren't translations were they the, the apostolic autographs but I mean since apostolic times we probably in our hands today have the best Bible on the market secondly we need to ask in order to get understanding from the Lord we need to ask the grace of God for submission to every word that's clearly addressed to us I've been listening to Pat Corey this week as a brother started putting all his videos up all his messages up online which I'm very pleased about and Patrick used to say you know you don't go out you shouldn't be going out the same way you came in if God's working we ought to be changed by attending to the word so we need to ask the grace of God for submission to every word that's clearly addressed to us and then of course as I've already mentioned we need to pray because only God knows perfectly what every verse means so he says to him consider what I say and the Lord give you understanding in all things remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David let me get the, get back to my place remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel so now he's moving on and uh, <coughs> it seems a strange thing to bring in the seed of David at this place and as far as I can recall from my commentaries none of them have much of an idea why that truth is brought in um, but it's an important truth nevertheless it's in fulfilment of God's promise in, in Genesis 12 to Abraham Jesus Christ is the seed of David and God promised Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 3 and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed this is a reference to the Lord Jesus not only the Jews it says here but all the families of the earth the Gentiles are blessed through Abraham because of his seed the Lord Jesus we find the same thing stated in Galatians chapter 3 Galatians chapter 3 and verse uh, 14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith and in verse 16 now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made he saith not unto seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ uh, but David too of course as is clear from Old, Old Testament history was a descendant of Abraham through Isaac, Jacob and Judah 
and the promise uh, to Abraham was confirmed to David in Psalm 132. Psalm 132. <coughs> the promise to Abraham confirmed to David, verse 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Um, so as I say this is an important truth uh, it confirms that the Lord Jesus is the true heir of the throne of Israel uh, in the opening verses of chapter 1 of Matthew as that genealogy is, is uh, given it begins in verse 1 with David and Abraham because Jesus was the promised seed of Abraham and the promised seed of David and God had said of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne so as we open the book of Matthew the book of the king we find the king's genealogy here and we find it beginning way back with Abraham coming all the way through <coughs> all the kings of Judah of course the uh, the times following the flood from Abraham and then on through uh, the history of Judah, the Israelites, of course, the northern kingdom were not of the tribe of Judah. The Lord Jesus came of the tribe of Judah, so we only have the kings of the southern kingdom here. Uh, and uh, in verse 2 of Matthew 1, we read Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. So the kings listed here, as I say, are all of the tribe of Judah, the kings from whom the Lord comes, are of the tribe of Judah. Now this list uh, in verse 1 is a simple statement really of chapter upon chapter upon chapter of the Old Testament history. Uh, if you've read your Old Testament, you'll know that the kings listed here are all named there uh, in the Old Testament and whose father was whose and whose son was whose and so on the list of the kings here exactly ties in with uh, the Old Testament history and it's always struck me that you couldn't manufacture that there's no way you could manufacture that because it's, it's, it's built into history those kings are real the history is real <coughs> some time ago I think it was a uh, Donald Trump said that Jerusalem should be the capital and uh, I was watching at the time I used to watch a, a geopolitical newscast with a conspiratorial bent and these guys are very clever very intelligent and one of them said something like uh, something to the effect you know Israel never had any kings or you know where they get the idea of Jerusalem being you know the, throne for, uh, the, the, the capital from and so forth and here's a man very intelligent. I've got the beginning of an idea. I've I, I got an idea. He mentioned Solomon and said, you know, he never existed. Uh, I was just amazed. In fact, I, I sent a comment, you know, wake up, will you? Wake up. The history, I didn't say wake up. The history is real. And uh, the list of kings that we read in Matthew 1 are built into history. It's They are just all laid out for us and all the surrounding events and some of those we looked at we went to the British Museum some of you remember some of those kings are named there Nebuchadnezzar's named there <coughs> Tiglath Pileser III is named there uh, King Jehu is named there on the, on, the, on the monuments in the British Museum the history is real and so uh, we have it here in chapter 1 now People sometimes say there are some anomalies here, but I've found in the past that if you chase up the anomalies, you get a blessing. <laughs> some of them are hard. Some of them are hard. But this is the true word of God, and it'll, it'll never fail if we if we pursue the subject. The, the Lord will undo the knot. Sometimes the knots are too big for me, and I don't want to untie them. But when you do, for example, when you look into why, where Cain got his wife from, you'll get a blessing if you're prepared to pursue it. And all the things that people raise, if you're prepared to pursue those things, the Lord, by the Scriptures, is able to show you why they are not contradictions. I don't believe there's a contradiction here. There are some kings missing. 
When we went to the British Museum, some of you might remember me using a clever phrase, damnatio memoriae, of damned memory. They used to erase kings from the king lists uh, in the Egyptian uh, chronicles. And there's a great, I can't remember which temple it's in, there's a great long line of kings listed in hieroglyphs, of course. But one of them was a heretic, uh, Tutankhamun. I think he was the father of Tutankhamun, I think. And he changed the religion and they blotted him off the history. And some of the names blotted out here are some of the most wicked kings in Israel. And it's, I think it's Damnatio Memoriae. There's a reason for it. Uh, Jeconiah, I'll blot his name out, says the Lord. Or something to that effect. And so he's not here. Coniah is a despised, despised broken idol. He's not here because of his wickedness. So if I haven't said it to you before, there are no errors in the King James Version. Uh, and I believe it's our, both our privilege and our duty to so assert. So Paul is upholding, exhorting Timothy to uphold at least three vital truths in, these two, in this verse, in fact. The first we've considered the Lord's Davidic descent. The second vital truth, of course, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. Let me go back. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Such a fantastic, such a staggering truth. And, you know, we break bread every morning, every Sunday. We take the wine every Sunday. <coughs> and I wonder how much it strikes us home to our hearts that this one who died is now seated in the glory at the right hand of the Father. And thank God he's coming back. Mm. I listened to some of the most wonderful preaching this week I've heard for a long, long time about the return of Jesus. And the glory that there'll be when he comes back. The power, the majesty, the glory. The two witnesses will be witnessing in Israel during the reign of Antichrist. They will have witnessed for three and a half years and they cannot be killed. They cannot be killed. No matter what Antichrist throws at them, they cannot be killed. And they witness for three and a half years and they're driving people crackers because they hate it. The, the, the people of the Antichrist time, they hate the gospel, they hate the saviour, they don't want to hear these messages and they hate those two witnesses. And eventually they're slain. After their witnesses finish, they're slain. And there they lie in the street for a while and maybe uh, well I, I, I think I'm not sure whether it says so but yes it does say that the, the world will celebrate they'll send gifts to one another it'll be the last Christmas this brother says <laughs> and th those bodies of those two witnesses will be shown all over the world I believe via satellite whatever people will be able to see and there'll be great rejoicing in the world over at last at last proof there is no God. And then suddenly, after three and a half days, these two men will rise up and everybody's you know, gloated over them, watching the TV. And then suddenly, they'll rise from there and they'll watch them on the TV with mouths open. Oh no. Oh no. And the brother tells me, and I believe he's right, that they'll be taken up into heaven in a cloud. And as the whole world watches them go up in that cloud... They'll disappear in the cloud and suddenly in the sun in the same cloud will come a white horse and they'll see the Lord coming in glory and what glory that will be when he rides out of heaven. So the Lord David reminds, uh, Paul reminds Timothy was raised from the dead. And he says, according to my gospel, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So the resurrection of the dead is a part of the gospel. You, can't, you cannot believe, you cannot be saved if you do not believe that the Lord Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Romans 10 9 and this is why the truth is important that particular truth is so important Romans chapter 10 
Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's crystal clear, isn't it, here, isn't it, that we we must believe in the resurrection of the dead. It's part of the gospel. And Paul includes in his gospel uh, resume in First Corinthians 15, where we'll not turn. <coughs> now the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is vital for this reason. It confirms the faithfulness of his ministry. By raising him from the dead, his father declares that there was no deceit in his mouth. Such was his spotless personal righteousness that God would not leave his soul in hell, nor suffer his holy one to see corruption. Psalm 16.10, I think. Um, Such was his spotless personal righteousness that God promised him he would not leave his soul in hell. Uh, John chapter 16. The vindication of his ministry. John chapter 16. Uh, where the Lord is speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in the world and to the saints. And in the opening verses he speaks of the Holy Spirit's ministry in the world. And at verse 7 we read. Verse 7. Nevertheless I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, that is to say, of my righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. So the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of the righteousness of Christ by the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> Um, so as I say yes it's, God sets his, his approval upon the ministry of Jesus by raising the dead we find the same truth in Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 the first few verses uh, to verse 4 verse 3 and 4 concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David it is again according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead declared to be the son of God by the resurrection of the dead that's the same truth so the second the resurrection of the Lord Jesus therefore is the second vital truth that Paul is exhorting Timothy to make a part of his ministry but Paul concludes, as we know, you will have noticed, by saying, according to my gospel. According to my gospel. And it means exactly that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Remember that Jesus Christ, verse 8, of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What Paul calls his gospel includes Jesus' resurrection which during Jesus' earthly ministry the twelve did not preach I've had to labour this many times and I'm not going to labour it again this morning but the twelve while Jesus was alive did not preach the gospel that Paul preached uh, because he hadn't died and he hadn't risen they preached the resurrection after he had risen but at first they didn't understand the blood atonement either the first hint you get at them understanding the blood atonement is when Philip meets with the Ethiopian eunuch and explains Isaiah 53 to him, which is all about the substitutionary atonement. And you remember the two on the way to Emmaus, the Lord met with them after his resurrection and he said, why are you sad? They were not expecting his resurrection. As far as they knew, he was gone and gone for good and they thought it would have been he which would have redeemed Israel. So I'll just say this, try and find any of the twelve preaching that the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead before he died. And if you find it, show it to me. The twelve were not preaching the same gospel as Paul. The central figure in both messages, of course, was Christ, but they're different messages. 
The twelve were preaching what the Bible calls the gospel of the kingdom. And it's defined in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Let's have a look at that. The gospel of the kingdom is defined in Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. Verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So this is what he's preaching. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What does he say? Verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. What gospel? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. <coughs> the Messiah has come, is what he's saying. The king has come. The time for Israel to, to regain its place before God has come if you will receive the king. That was the message. It wasn't the blood. And you'll look in vain for it. The Lord alludes to it himself once or twice, but you won't find it in the pre-crucifixion preaching of the apostles. But in its time context, before the New Testament was written, the kingdom of God to Jewish ears meant that the Messiah, the King of Israel, had come, and through him Psalm 2, to take just one example, was about to be fulfilled. Let's look at Psalm 2. This is what a devout Jew would have thought of when John the Baptist, the Lord, came saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It'd be Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now Israel were looking for that. And so of course you can imagine how downhearted, downcast and defeated they were when the Lord was crucified. They loved him, of course. So they have been downcast over that. But all their messianic hopes would have seemed to have been dashed until, of course, they learned the truth of his resurrection. And uh, he sends them out preaching the same message at first until he calls Paul, who preaches our gospel. Um, so when you read Romans, as we have done recently, you'll see the difference. Paul there explains the substitutionary atonement, tells us what happened at the cross, tells us how that we have died with Christ, tells us how that his blood cleanses us from all sin. And that's the message of Paul's gospel, the substitutionary atonement. Redemption for sinners by faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. He does speak, of course, of the future of the nation of Israel in chapters 9 through 11, because those kingdom promises will be fulfilled. He defines his place, he defines his gospel, doesn't he? In 1 Corinthians, I've alluded to it, 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel that I preach, he says to them, which you have believed and by which you are saved. 1 Corinthians 15, I'll get there eventually. Moreover, brethren, I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and where did you stand? Notice he doesn't mention the twelve. He doesn't say this was the gospel that the twelve preached. The gospel I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and where did you stand? By which also ye are saved, if you keep your memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you. So now he's going to tell them what his gospel is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so Paul calls this my gospel. And for the repentant sinner, atonement through the blood of Christ is more than music to his ears. Yes, we're looking forward to the Lord coming back. We're looking forward to him setting up his kingdom in Israel. But for the needy sinner, but for the man whose heart is broken over his sins, the gospel is music to his ears. I'm more than glad that I can say today that God, knowing all my personal vileness, looks rather upon the blood of his Son and for Jesus' sake forgives me and welcomes me freely and forever. If, like the prodigal son, you find yourself among the swine, know that just like his Father, our Heavenly Father, is looking out for you to come home.
and will welcome you with amazing love. I've thought of myself like that prodigal of late, believe it or not. Uh, but the father was looking for him to come home and went out to meet him and embraced him and slew the fatty calf and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And we might come to the Lord feeling ashamed of ourselves and sometimes we should. But let's remember the blood. Let's remember the blood. Let's remember the welcome. Let's remember that God has great things for us. Just as that father loved and blessed his son, so the father loves and will bless us, surely. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.